Well folks, this is yet another video of another hurricane that I went through as a kid. This one is one that's remembered by a lot of residents of the Florida Panhandle and people in Alabama. Uh, Hurricane Ivan. Uh, today, September 16th, is the eight year anniversary of Ivan, which hit on the si September 16th of 2004. It made landfall around uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama at about 2.45 a.m., I think, Central Time. As you can see, this is a radar loop of the hurricane. It made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane with 130 mile an hour winds. Uh, it was such a strong Category 3 that if the winds had been one mile per hour higher, it would have been a Category 4. So a lot of people still consider it a Category 4 because it did so much damage to the Pensacola area. As you see in this loop, the western half of Pensacola got that big red blob which is the right front quadrant of the eye wall. Actually the entire Florida Panhandle got the right front quadrant. And um, Pensacola actually got the eye wall of the hurricane for three hours straight. Uh, here, as you can see, probably about 40 miles from the worst of the hurricane. Still got some pretty considerable damage here. Uh, the storm surge probably did the most of it. But um, anyway, I was uh, eight years old when this hurricane hit in third grade. And uh, I'm gonna tell you my story. And I got this radar loop from the same website I got the dentist loop from, except uh, for some reason it's um, URL has changed. It's now Andrew dot RSMAS dot Miami dot edu or whatever, something along those lines. So to be in the story, the original tracks of the hurricane had had the eye coming over exactly over where we, where we live, Fort Walton Beach. And uh, so we were making preparations pretty early, uh, within a week before the actual storm. We were like going, getting water and stuff, stocking up on pretty much everything imaginable. And the day before they let us out for school, I remember there was my math teacher uh, being really concerned about the hurricane because earlier that day, it had been upgraded to a Category 5 for the third time in its lifespan. And it was uh, hitting Cuba, or just hit Cuba at that time. So, they let us out for school. We didn't have school the next day. We pretty much made preparations. And we planned to evacuate to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The day we did leave, I believe was September 14th, 2004, and I remember waking up at about 6 a.m., maybe 6.30. I went downstairs, and my mom was taping up the windows. Um, we, it's pretty much impossible to secure plywood on our house because the window frames are made of aluminum, and the outside of our house is mostly brick. So we pretty much have no way to secure the plywood to our windows. So taping the windows up was the best we could do. But yeah, she was taping the windows. Uh, she told me to go take a shower, so that's what I did. We all showered. And then we all uh, pretty much packed up the car, which at the time was a Ford Windstar. And uh, my dad left his car, but he parked it like well away from the trees. Because we knew this was going to be a bad storm. Anyway, uh, the day we left, it was a Category 4 with 100... 50 mile an hour winds I think it was and it was turning north and the landfall location was forecast to be exactly in Mobile Bay or around Mobile somewhere so when we left we drove west along Highway 98 and uh, used I-110 in Pensacola and at the time 
they were starting to repair and resurface and everything the I-110 in Pensacola. So at the time it was a very crappy road. It was like super freaking bumpy. And yeah, we were glad to get off that road. But anyway, here it is. It's mu it's a much better freeway now. But it used to just really suck. And uh eventually we just went westward through Pensacola. Uh, went into Baldwin County, I believe, Alabama, and uh, we took the back roads up to Montgomery, where we stopped for gas and let our cat, we were taking our cat with us, we let him stop and go to the bathroom, and we were just, you know, stopping, and I think we got, like, McDonald's or something there, I don't, I don't remember what we had for lunch, but after that, we took... A highway, not a freeway, just a regular back road, all the way up to Tuscaloosa. And we stayed in this hotel. Not the courtyard, it was the uh, Fairfield Inn in Tuscaloosa. Ironically enough, this hotel was just south of where the tornado hit back in 2011. As you can see, uh, the hotel's right here. Path of the tornado right there. So, we got to our hotel and uh, we pretty much went around, we drove around town that day uh, pretty much trying to see if we can get our, get to Norway around the town so we wouldn't get lost. And yeah, that's pretty much what we did. Uh, I think we had room service for dinner. And, um, I ordered spaghetti, I believe it was. And we had, um, some Big Red, which is soda that we packed with us. Had some of that. And all the while, my parents were still watching the news and the weather. And my dad was on his laptop looking up all the latest things on the hurricane. Uh, it was still category four. And, uh, it was heading up. And that night, we also saw the very first, my brother and I, we saw the very first episode of Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. Which was the one where Cookie was wearing that big red jacket, and he couldn't take it off. Anyway, I remember the weather forecast saying that it was about 70 degrees with fair skies. And... In their week ahead forecast, there was a lot of bad weather. The next day, we woke up, got some, we did some more preparations, like we went to a supermarket, and I noticed at the time that that's when it started to get cloudy outside. The outflow of the hurricane was beginning to uh, emerge over Alabama. And then after that, we went back to the hotel. Uh, my dad, my brother, and I swam in the hotel pool for probably about an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, and we remembered the elevator in the hotel sounded like a weird cat meowing. Like whenever the elevator would accelerate upward or uh, decelerate to get to its floor, it sounded like a cat meowing. So, we had Outback for dinner we used these really cheap knives in order to cut the steak. They were white knives with like this blade about four or five inches long. They dulled really easily. Like we could only get one use out of them before like we couldn't use them anymore. The next day we got up it had already started raining and uh, by then the hurricane had already made landfall in Gulf Shores and affected everywhere in the Florida Panhandle as well as Alabama. And uh, it was weakening slowly. Uh, by the time we woke up it was I believe a category two. And we pretty much just stayed in the hotel like for the entire morning. But while my parents were watching the Weather Channel I remember seeing on TV the picture of the I-10 bridge in Pensacola 
completely destroyed. I remember seeing that exact picture on the news. Later on is when I was working on my book report for school. I brought it along so I could work on it while we were in the hotel. And uh, I had just finished and the wind was starting to pick up outside. Um, the wind was blowing this way and we had a room on this side of the hotel. So we started hearing that weird whistly sound that you hear whenever there's a lot of wind outside, you know, the um, wind blowing through the tight spaces in the windows. That eerie whistling sound. And uh, we saw a grasshopper on the screen of the window just hanging on for dear life. And it stayed there for several hours. So I had done my book report and then I decided to practice presenting it because it was pretty much due the week we got back to school. I practiced my book report and I was asking how I was doing and stuff, you know, hey, how'd I do? And my parents said I did all right. And then the power went out. It was probably about, oh, I don't know, 11, 10 or 11 a.m. I think. So after that, we just continued to look out the window at the storm and uh, the winds kept getting stronger and stronger then eventually we heard these little kids running around in the middle of the hallway they were making a huge racket so I peered out the peephole and there were these three little black kids just running up and down the hall they were like yeah the power's out this is awesome and we looked out the emergency lights were on but it wasn't really enough to light up the hallway that much then my dad and I decided, hey, you know, there's nothing else to do. So we went out in the hallway and pretty much walked around the entire hotel. During walking around the hotel, whenever we got close to the stairwell, which was right next to a big window and an air conditioner, we would hear this sound. Now this is a video by Mike Tice of Ultimate Chase. Uh, I'm just going to show you a tiny bit of it so I could it's right here, I think. This is what we heard. Except it wasn't as loud as you can imagine. We also heard that. From the wind. Uh, we got back to the room. My mom and my brother were sitting there. And for some reason, I can't, I don't, I don't know why, but mom made me take another shower. I to this day I still have no idea why. But anyway, I was I went into the bathroom, started taking a shower. Surprisingly, we still had hot water. And uh, I was in there. We had a, a big flashlight, like one of those big floodlight ones that required those huge batteries, about this big. Anyway, we had one of those. Put it in the bathroom, turned it on. And while I was in the shower, I remember looking up at the ceiling and thinking, Oh crap, the roof's leaking! But it turns out, it was just the shadow of the shower curtain. So I got out of the shower, and um, went back into the room. I think my brother took a shower after that. And he got done. And we were bored. And my mom, she was going nuts. Because that sound of the wind just blowing through the windows, just driving her nuts. She could not stand it. So we decided to go down to the lobby of the hotel. The elevator, of course, wasn't working, so we used the stairs. And uh, when we got to the lobby, there were quite a few people down there. I think they all pretty much got the same idea we did. And I remember there was a guy on his laptop, but 
it was still plugged into the wall and I'm not sure why and there was pretty much people were talking you know and for some reason some idiot decided to open all the windows in the lobby like the windows could only open about half a foot but still the the windows were facing the direction of the wind so there was all kinds of water and stuff just blowing in and the carpets and the curtains what and everything we sat down at the table which was probably for breakfast we just sat down at the table and talked uh, and I think my dad was over at the hotel check-in desk talking about something I don't remember there was this kid he had this bowl of stuff uh, he was probably about my age and he was trying to use the microwave and he's like why isn't it working ah! I was just laughing my butt off in my head thinking dude really <laughs> eventually he had to eat his stuff cold he wasn't very happy and uh so my dad got back my brother my dad and I eventually decided to venture outside the wind was probably blowing at about 50 60 miles an hour we stood right under this thing and our actual room was like over here somewhere on the second floor I believe it was but yeah we stood out there the wind was blowing pretty hard I mean like these trees were bending there were there were a couple trees in here that like snapped in half and uh, there was crap all over the parking lot I was afraid one of these trees was just gonna blow down because it seriously looked like they were about to and uh we were out there for uh, probably a little less than five minutes you could not hear yourself talk you had to scream in order to be heard so the wind was so loud and I'm surprised that you know didn't blow our glasses off her face or anything because the wind was blowing directly at us we eventually went back inside my mom was like well how was it and we're like oh it's it's pretty bad out there and went back to our room waited out the rest of the storm and then the grasshopper wasn't on the window anymore after about an hour or so the winds began dying down you know the um, sound of the uh, whistly through the windows wasn't get, it wasn't as loud power came back on we started watching the news and at this point the storm was moving had was starting to move away from us it was hitting Birmingham so it was this is um from weather underground by the way or the one I'm going to at the moment there's an entire page dedicated to Ivan and pretty much to any hurricane anyway this is a uh, regional radar loop showing you what times the storm hit and whatnot it's better than the other one anyway we were right here center of the storm passed just east of us So, a little after the wind started dying down, we decided to go and drive around. We hopped in the van, started driving around. I remember there were, we saw enough damage around town. Like, it was mainly tree damage, like, you know, tree snap in half or big tree limbs down. Every now and then you'd see a roof with a few shingles blown off, stuff like that. Uh most of the signs in the town were completely blown out from what I remember there were a lot of signs just blown out uh, traffic lights were laying in the middle of the road at some intersections uh, by then most of the town still didn't have any power uh, the north side of town, Northport uh, they had full power but anyway the wind was still blowing hard enough to for the traffic lights to be swinging that crazy and I remember seeing every single American flag that was flying that people forgot to take down except for one large one at a bank 
They were all just shredded into pieces. And meanwhile, we're thinking, boy, wonder, if our, wonder how our cat's doing at the kennel. Drove back to the hotel, and uh, we decided to leave the next day to go back home. I actually don't remember what we had for dinner that night. The next day we left, we uh, got a copy of the Birmingham newspaper, and we headed back to, we headed back home pretty much the same way we went to get there. We Actually, I don't think we went through Montgomery again. I think we went through Greenville or something like that. And uh, we were told to avoid Pensacola at all costs. They said, oh man, there was extreme freaking damage there. Don't go there. Everything is just really bad there. So we entered the um, state, Niskanby County, probably through Highway 90. And the funny thing was, the second we got into Florida, I started seeing completely uprooted trees just on the side of the road. And uh, we continued all the way to Crestview and uh, started using Highway 85 going down. And the traffic there was horrible. Like, all the evacuees, just like us, were heading back home. We were stuck in Crestview for at least an hour. Uh, it was moving really slow. I remember seeing a few guys on top of a warehouse roof trying to fix it. There was a big old hole in it. And the more south we went, the worse the damage got. Eventually, we got home. And, uh... We could not park our car in the driveway. It There was just too much crap in the middle of the driveway to park the car there. So we had to get out and clear stuff out later on. And I remember the first thing I had to do when we got home, I really had to take a dump. So I was the first one in the house, just ran upstairs as fast as I could. And when I was done, I remember I was thinking, hey mom, should I flush the toilet? I remember hearing on the radio that the plumbing's not working. And she said, oh, that's only for Pensacola. The plumbing still works here. So I was kind of relieved. It was really hot and sticky in the house. The smell of stale air. We went and looked around. There were no leaks, which was a good thing. We were missing about 11 shingles, though. And there was there were leaves plastered all over the windows from all the wind and rain. We started cleaning up almost right away, which is when we started clearing stuff out of the driveway. And our neighbors didn't come home for another few days and I remember our next door neighbors described us that it was 13 hours of rain and wind just constant and that they were never going to stay for a hurricane again I did some math probably the most math I'll ever do in my life and I have concluded my dad said that um, the winds gusted up to 122 on Eglin Air Force Base so Furlong Beach most likely got wind, sustained winds of around 95 miles an hour, gusting to, you know, over 120. Uh, there was a 117 gust recorded in Mary Esther, which is just west of Fort Walton. We went to sleep. Uh, pretty much what we did that night is there was a curfew. We could not go anywhere after, after 8 o'clock. So we had candles on candles lit, flashlights on, we were eating dinner in the dark, all the windows were open, and my mom eventually took my mattress out of my room, put it in my brother's room on the floor, and she put his mattress on the floor also, and the, you know, you remember those tap lights, like you'd see on those uh, infomercials, that they'd be like a circle, and you'd just tap them to turn them on, we had a few of those, so... My mom lined every few steps of the staircase with them so that we wouldn't trip and fall down and break our necks. And one of them was put in our room. 
as like sort of a nightlight because my brother and I hadn't outgrown the nightlight stage yet. So, yeah. And I remember our neighbors just down the street had their generator on all night and we were really pissed because they just would not turn it off so loud. We had a hard time falling asleep because of it. When we did, we later on woke up the next morning about 9 in the morning. 8 or 9 in the morning. And, uh, showered because we still had water, no hot water, but the water was still working. And uh, we went outside. My mom went and took a few pictures. These were the actual pictures. As you see, that is not a tree. That is a giant tree limb that somehow wedged itself between the tree limbs. And you see it's completely defoliated like no leaves on the tree at all. This is our front yard by the way. This is our pool. And there was a really good sized tree limb in there. It was completely black because of all the leaves and algae and stuff that was just growing in there. And it took both my mom and my dad all their strength to pull that thing out of the pool. And it ended up ripping the pool liner, so we had to get it patched. That's our pool again, from a different perspective. There's my brother. He was... The funny thing was, he had just turned, like, five years old. Or, hold on. 2004, he was... Yeah, he had just turned five years old. Like, not a week before. There's the same part of our backyard again. That's our pool pump. My brother's still there. There was actually a branch wedged between two of the slats of the fence. Or two of the, yeah, two of the boards. These are two trees, there are actually um, four trees in our backyard. Uh, that, this is one, it's, the top half of it's completely defoliated. This one is a popcorn tree. Uh, we had it removed later that year, or no, the next year. The tree had completely snapped in half. And uh, this tree was a cherry laurel. It was in the shape of a Y, so there was a, something going right here. It also snapped in half, but fell in the opposite direction. And uh, this tree actually narrowly missed our neighbor's shed. Just like by a half foot. And there was another tree right behind here. It wasn't that tall. It was only up to about here. And it received virtually no damage at all. And uh, this is the uh, part of the tree that missed our neighbor's shed. And that is the other part of our backyard behind our pool. It took a while to clean that up. And there's the branch I was talking about that was wedged between the fence. It wasn't until around 2007 or 8 or so that I finally went out and just wedged that branch out of there. Like, it was there for years before it was finally removed. Oh, and this light right here originally had a top to it. The winds of the storms blew it off. We it took us a while to find it under all that stuff in the yard. Anyway, later that day, or that morning actually, we went to a, uh, little station where they were handing out bags of ice and MREs and stuff on Jet Drive, listening to the radio. We kept hearing, like, this advertisement saying, like, blah be blah be blah and call 1-800-STORM, something like that. Anyway, it was along this road. And we just went back home and kept cleaning up. And, uh, yeah. The day after that, we still had no power. Still cleaning stuff up. Same old ritual. But, that morning, we were going to Sonic. It was one of the few places in town that still had power. And we were going to get a drink, because we were thirsty. And, uh, we started hearing all kinds of sirens, and we're thinking, what the heck is going on? And... Lo and behold, the restaurant right across the street was on fire. The restaurant was a restaurant called the Golden Dragon. 
Uh, it's actually located on Highway 98 now. But back then it used to be located right around here somewhere. Yeah, right here. This is the building. The building's still there. It has no roof. And if you can see, this isn't a very good picture, but uh, and that's the building. No roof. Still stands to this day. Meanwhile, we were at Sonic, which is right over here. And that was the first time I ever saw a building burn down. And, uh, my mom was the one to go out and take a look at it. And, uh, the weird thing was, there was a fire in like two or three different places. There was a f main, there was a fire right here in this part of the roof. Then there was a fire right back here. And then there was a big fire over here. Now, when they put out this fire, they uh, went over and started trying to put this one out. However, shortly after that, this fire reignited and just became bigger than before. And we left right after that fire reignited. It was super huge. We went right along here, turned around right there while looking at the building on fire. Then went down this road, Page Bacon Road. Now as we passed these buildings right here, you see this huge column of smoke like right here and you looked way up and for some reason it looked like that there were explosions going off in the column of smoke. Our power came back on later that day and for a while I was afraid of our house catching on fire because uh, the Golden Dragon caught on fire due, an, due to an electrical problem and I was afraid that I would somehow cause something to short out. Every now and then I'm still cautious of that but it took me a while to get over it. Like several months. Anyway, so power came back on later that day and uh, we pretty much kept cleaning up. We learned that this road along Highway 98 on Oakloos Island was completely obliterated. And uh, if you see my Dennis video, uh, nine month, nine or ten months after Ivan, Dennis, after the road had just been repaired, Dennis came and obliterated it all over again. But I remember we were heading down here they had reduced this road to two lanes because the westbound lanes were destroyed but the eastbound lanes were okay for the most part they were the ones that got repaired the fastest now I have some uh, pictures in my bookmarks uh, Hurricane Ivan photo coverage from NOAA here are some pictures of right after the hurricane. This is probably either a day after or just directly after. Anyway, this was the hurricane that wiped out all the dunes. You can see, you can tell, there, see here's like a little dune clump. You'd find one of those every now and then. And then it'd be completely flat after that. This, there was actually an observatory on top of this, and it had sand eroded from underneath its, fan, or its foundation. So eventually, I think it was before Dennis, or after Dennis, they just pushed it off, because they knew it was unsafe for anybody to go there. So they just pushed it off the dune, and then cleaned it up after it landed. Uh, there's 98. Um, just carnage as far as the eye can see. This part of the road, the storm surge cut a huge channel, like it was more than 10 feet deep. Uh, I th I'm sure they had to um, dredge sand out of the sound and put it on there so they could rebuild the road.
Let me see if I can first zoom in so you could see the extent of the damage. It's I might have to use a different photo, but Yeah, right along here, the westbound lanes are completely gone. And the eastbound lanes are trashed. And right here is where the westbound lane or the yeah, the westbound lanes start to come back. But as you can see, more damage. The road took like eight months to repair, I think. It was quite a while. Here's another picture. Uh, the road looks fine there. That part of the road didn't have to be repaired. Um, right over here is when it's was where the carnage starts. As you can see, there's areas on the barrier island that just completely filled up with water from storm surge. They were flooded for like the next month. Now there's a good photo of the destroyed road. <laughs> this was pretty much the scene everywhere. Um, if you go to, uh, there's actually a place on Gulf Islands National Seashore, just south of Gulf Breeze, where the island was completely breached. See, you, the road is not even there anymore at all. Anyway, right over here, the, the island got breached. There's very shallow water covering this area. It's right along here. In fact, I'll show you some. Here's that same stretch of island, Google Earth. Uh, as you can see, there's still a few areas where it looks like it's recovered for the most part. If you go to historical imagery, okay, this is 2012, 2011. See, look, there's still some areas where the sand hasn't completely filled up. The, uh, still isn't completely filled up where it was washed out. This is 2010, 2008, two thousand seven, two thousand yeah again two thousand seven, two thousand six, two thousand five, two thousand four. And this was before Ivan. Look. Before Ivan, uh, the island looked like this. And after Ivan, the island looks completely different. But yeah, that happened right there. Uh, there was another place somewhere in Gulf Shores that also had a breach. Um, Perdido Key, which is right along here, was completely flattened. There was, like, not much left there. And here is the Pensacola Bridge. Uh, in this picture, there's still the old bridge. This is after, this is in 2004. This is an area where they had to make emergency repairs. And same with this area. We didn't use that bridge for a long time. Like, we didn't use it until 2009. But anyway. Yeah, so, a couple weeks after I went to Pensacola, extreme carnage there, giant debris piles in front of all the houses and buildings and businesses, roofs blown off, giant hundred year old oak trees just laying in the middle of the road, all kinds of stuff like that. We went along Scenic Highway and saw the bridge, Pensacola Bridge, or on I-10. We saw the part of it that was just collapsed into the bay. The funny thing was, on one side of the road, the houses were super damaged, and then on the other side, they were perfectly fine. I don't understand that. Uh, apparently, there were a lot of 
stories like that that came after Andrew back in 1992 also. Anyway, it took a while for us to clean up after that. And the beaches are still recovering. In fact, I'll have to show you something in a little bit. I have to find it first thing before I move on. Here's, there's a picture right along here of the East Pass, which is when Oakless Island ends and Destin begins. There was some pretty considerable beach erosion around here. Noriego Point right there was breached. This dune lake was almost completely filled up with sand. And right here, a big channel was cut because of all the storm surge. That's what it looks like from afar. So here it is. Essentially, this is what the beach looked like after Ivan. Just completely flat. There's that observatory I was talking about. And here's a dune clump that survived. Um, this happens to be on news.webshots.com. This is uploaded by Right Kid. There's more surviving dunes, followed by flatness. You can actually see the Gulf of Mexico. I remember actually driving by that. That was the Eglin Officers Beach Club, completely destroyed. And this was the traffic in the other lane. And it was really backed up because it had to be reduced to only one lane. And more carnage along the beach. Now this happens to be along the sound side. There wasn't much dunes there to begin with, but these are the westbound lanes of 98. Here they're starting to repair the road. But essentially, that was what happened. We also went to a Beasley Park later on that day, which is right over here. The dunes used to extend out to about here, and they were washed out all the way to there. And we later went to Destin, it was pretty much the same story. This is a souvenir newspaper by the Northwest Florida Daily News that I still have. And apparently it was printed out the day after Ivan hit. Anyway, that's the road I was just talking about. This was uh, on the 16th. This basically has um, all kinds of pictures, like that's along uh, Scenic Highway in Walton County. That is near Holbert Field. They're just pretty much articles and stuff about results of the hurricane. That's a uh, shelter. It was at Bruner Middle School. There's some of the damage in Pensacola. There's Navarre. This is stuff washed completely over the road. And that happens to be a yellow barge sitting across Highway 98 for Long Beach. This is stuff like mainly from Walton County, that area, Sandiston. There's Nashville. That's Pensacola Beach or Navarre Beach. And this happens to be a marina. And this marina. It is now called the Legendary Marina, but it used to be called Brooks Bridge Marina. 
it had a tornado completely rip off one of its walls. You can see right here where it was repaired. But anyway, if you go back to uh, 2005 or so, or in 2006, you see they're still repairing it. 2005, there you go. All that damage is still there. Weird thing was, though, that was probably the only other damage the tornado did. It didn't affect any other businesses or anything. There was also another house, or another two houses on the island that were trashed because of possible tornadoes. That was one of them. And there's a boat wedged under the Shalmar Bridge. You saw that everywhere. And that completely destroyed docks. As well as... Oh, I guess we should be glad a car didn't end up in our pool. Anyway. This was the pool of a condo in our city. As well as a boat that washed up. Plenty of there's just boats everywhere. And that is the restaurant I told you about that was on fire. Yeah. And another boat along Highway 98. Anyway, this paper is just all kinds of articles from the days following Ivan, you know. That's pretty ironic. Um, and meanwhile, Gene was becoming a problem for those folks in Port St. Lucie. Believe it or not, sports, they were still being covered like crazy. Preston Hood Chevrolet. And here's a story of a baby born during Ivan. Yeah, there are some, this is just, I think there was one after Dennis too, we didn't keep that one. Anyway, there we go. Well, once again, there's this picture. This is pretty much the result of Ivan. Uh, one other shingle was lost because of Dennis. But anyway, as you can see in the middle of the screen, uh, along the roof, you can see spots where there are no shingles. The roof still has not been repaired. But um, it hasn't really been giving us any problems, which is good. This is one of the siding, one of the parts of siding that was peeled back from the winds of Ivan. A uh, severe thunderstorm came back and repealed them back after we uh, fixed it twice. And this is along the other side, where there, it was also peeled back by the winds of Ivan. This piece of siding was actually found about 15 feet away from the house, lying on the side of the yard. Uh, as you see, it's kind of... It, it's, it may look a little loose in this picture, just because it is. Um, we refastened it a few days before Dennis hit, and then Dennis came and loosened it up again, and we never really got to reattaching it completely so it's still there just hanging on by some nails up at the top and that is pretty much the damage that we had from our house due to Ivan that is my Hurricane Ivan story. Happening eight years ago today, September 16th, 2004.